Hi, my name's Alfie Vaughan and I'm a nuke artist at the mill. In this quick video, I'm going to be showing how I utilise Nuke's new copycat tool to do a load of roto on a project I worked on at the end of last year. Okay, so this is one of 17 shots on the project. As you can see, everything was filmed on a massive green screen stage and we had a few actors in the foreground. One of the key reasons that led to me using copycat for this project was that the entire edit was over five minutes long. I was the only visual effects artist working on this. I did all of the 2D and the 3D and I only had about six weeks to do everything. So the deadline was really tight. Obviously to get full body roto for five minutes of footage would have been extremely expensive and also take a very long time. So about a week into the project, I started dabbling with copycat just to see if it could make anything a bit easier. And I was absolutely blown away with the results. In the end, it pretty much saved the project. I'm not really sure how I would have finished it if copycat hadn't existed. So now I'm gonna go through step by step and show you how I used it. The first thing to note about this footage is you might be wondering why I was having to do any roto when it was shot on a green screen. I can tell you from working on a huge amount of commercials that the amount of green screen shots that are done purely from keying and don't have any roto are almost none. In this case, the main problem I was facing was that a lot of the actors' costumes were very similar hues to the green screen. So things like this leopard print coat, as you can see, are very similar, and the same sort of thing with some of the highlights on the suit. If I add a key light node and just try and key this really quickly, you'll be able to see what I mean. So that's the basic key, and then if I crunch this down a little bit, you can see the key really doesn't work very well. And as soon as you start pushing the black and white points to get the edge better, you can see that it's completely unusable. And then if you look at it on the run, you can see it's really chattery. So I realized pretty early on that this wasn't going to work just from keying it and I had to find another solution. And that's where copycat came in. So basically I did full body roto on all of the silhouettes of the people. And then on some of the wider shots where the hair wasn't super fine, I actually used it to do roto of the hair as well. And it worked really well. So here's how you get started. The first step with copycat is working out your reference frames. The reference frames are what you give to the copycat node to train it on. And from there it can work out a before and after and then interpolate that across your entire shot. So for Roto, what you're looking for specifically is frames where the actors are in different positions. That way you can have a nice varied data set that you can use for the copycat training, and it's more likely that you'll get a good result at the end of it. So the first thing I would do for each of the shots that I was working on was just scrub through and work out where the good reference frames might be. In the case of this shot, there's not very much movement, so it makes it a little bit trickier. But as you can see, there's some movement at the end here, so it'll be worth capturing that. And there may be a couple more at the beginning as well. Depending on the length of your shot and how much the subject is moving, you might want to do more or less reference frames. In this case, I'm probably only going to do three or four. I think one at the end here, probably one about here, maybe one here, and then one at the beginning will probably do fine for this. This is an example of one of the more complicated shots that I also used copycat to do the roto for. As you can see, there's loads more movement going on in these shots, so it's much more tricky to roto. And as a result, these are the reference frames that I set up. So you can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I did 10 reference frames for this. This shot is nearly 2,400 frames long. So it was really important to make sure I had enough reference frames to capture all of the main poses. But like I said, for this one, there's not too much movement going on, so we can probably get away with three or four. So the first thing to do once you've had a quick look at the footage is go through and add a frame hold for each of the frames you want to use as a reference frame. So for the first one, let's just say we're going to use frame one. So I'm going to add a frame hold onto this frame. Make sure it's set to 1001. Then let's go through to where he's moved a little bit. Let's say maybe here. So this is 1022. And then let's add one at the end after he's moved a little bit as well. So let's go for the last frame. So that's 1066. And I think those three frames will be plenty of reference for this shot. Next, what you want to do is add a frame range node and then plug this in under the footage. And you want to set both of these to one. This is so that later on when we plug these three into an append clip node, it will read them as individual frames. Then the next step is to start making the mats for each frame. So let's start on the first one. Then what I'm gonna do is add a roto node. I turn on replace so that it overrides the alpha. Then what I do is just go in and draw a rotor shape around the entire silhouette of the actor. The more time you spend making this look good, the better the outcome will be. So it's worth taking your time to do this properly. With traditional roto, normally you would go in and make simple shapes for all of the body parts so that it's easier to keep the roto consistent. But in this case, because I'm not doing any manual roto, it doesn't matter. I'm just supplying the copycat node with three different alphas and it treats the alphas more like images than roto shapes. So it doesn't really matter that it's just one massive shape. Okay, that looks pretty good. And this is the alpha that we have for this frame. You might notice that I've avoided doing the hair. Some of the shots with hair copycat actually did quite a good job. But as the green screen was pretty good in this area, I found that I could get a good enough key from this anyway. Right, that's one done. I'm gonna speed up this next section and do the next two frames as well. Right, that's the last one done. So I now have an alpha for each of these frames, as you can see. The next thing to do is plug all three of these into an append clip node. So I'm gonna select them all and then search for append clip. And then if I set my timeline to input, you can see it's now basically created a three frame timeline. And this is what we're gonna to use to feed to the copycat node. So if I search for copycat, 
The node has two inputs. The first one is called input, and this is what goes into your actual footage. So this will just be the clean reference frames without anything done to them. And then the ground truth is the output of the reference frames that you intend for copycat to interpolate across your entire image sequence. So in this case, we want to plug the input into the append clip node. So this is just gonna be looking at the three clean frame holds up here. I'm gonna add a remove node and plug it in under here and just keep RGBA, set it to keep. And then for the ground truth, we want to separate out the alpha into a mat that we can then train copycat to look at. So to do that, I'm gonna add a shuffle node. I'm gonna plug it into the append clip and then I'm gonna shuffle the alpha into all of the other channels so that it's in RGB as well. So if I look at that, it looks like this. And then what I'm gonna do is isolate it down to just one channel. So for example, the red channel. So we can add another remove node, set it to keep. I'm gonna change channels to RGB and then turn off green and blue so that we're just keeping the red channel. Then I can plug the ground truth input on the copycat node into this. This is where it's gonna save all of the training files. So we want to make a folder for this. I'm gonna make a new folder and I'm gonna call it copycat. Doesn't matter what you call it, but it's good to make a folder because it makes loads of files. Then the next setting is the epochs. This is how many iterations of the training it's going to run. At the moment it's on 10,000 and I found that generally something between 40 and 60,000 gave me a really usable result for all of the shots. The nice thing about this is that you can set it to something like 40,000 and then start the training. And then if you look at it and decide that it needs a bit longer, you can resume the training instead of having to do it all again. So I'm gonna start it on 40,000 and see how it gets on. There's more settings under the advanced tab. These allow you to optimize the training model a bit more depending on what you're doing. But I found that I didn't need to tweak any of these to get good results, so I'm just gonna leave it for now. So now we have it set up, so we have our ground truth and the input and we're ready to kick off the training. So I'm gonna press start training. It's gonna think about it for a little bit. And then as you can see, a box appears here. All of these boxes are essentially crops of the frame. The far left-hand side ones are our input. So these are the clean reference frames that we set up. Then the middle is the ground truth. This is the red mat that we created from the roto shapes. And then finally, the output is the current result of the training. As you can see at the moment, there's a huge discrepancy between the ground truth and the output, and that's because it's only just started the training. But as this goes on for longer, you should start to see that the output gets closer and closer to the look of the ground truth. And ideally, you can get them to look exactly the same, and that's when you know that you can stop the training. You can also visualize it by looking at the graph in the graphs tab. I never really found myself needing to use this, but it's quite handy to visualize what's happening. Essentially, the further up the graph the line goes, the more inaccurate it is. So you want to see it slowly getting less and less as the time goes on. Okay, it's about halfway through now and I'm going to pause it because as you can see, the output is looking pretty much exactly the same as the ground truth. So what I'm going to do is press cancel and it's just going to pause it wherever it got to. Then I can go back to the copycat node tab and I can press create inference, which will make an inference node. The inference node is how you actually utilize all of the training you've just done and apply it to your footage. So if I take this inference node and I plug the input into my footage and then I look at the inference node, you can see that it's now generating a mat for the entire image sequence. The edges look really nice and consistent, so I'm really happy with how this looks. And it took less than 40 minutes to train this. So now to make use of this, what I can do is shuffle this back into the alpha channel. So I'm gonna add a shuffle node and I'm gonna shuffle the red into the alpha. Now if I look at the alpha channel, we have this. One thing I have found when doing Roto with Copycat is if you gamma down, it leaves quite a lot of holes in the mat. It might be a case that it just needs to be trained for a bit longer to fix this. In general, I found that as long as the edges are okay, it doesn't matter that there's holes in the middle because you can just grade the alpha to fix it. So to do that, I can just add a grade node. I can change the channels to alpha and then I can turn the white point up and the black point down a little bit to compensate for the gaps in the alpha. Now if I gamma the viewport down, you can see that it's absolutely fine. So there we go. Now that we have a working alpha, I can add a copy node and I can copy this alpha into my footage and then pre-mult it. That gives me something like this. And then from here, you can start to do all of your edge work, just like with other Roto to get it to a final result. So for example, for this one, I'm just gonna do a bit of an edge extension. I'm gonna despill the footage to get rid of some of the green hue. That's already looking loads better. And then finally to finish it off, I'm gonna use key light just to key the hair back on top. The last thing that's worth doing is making sure that you clamp the alpha after you've added the grade node. By turning up the white point to compensate for the holes in the mat, it's actually made the alpha value above one for quite a lot of the shot. And the same thing for the key light as well. As you can see, this is currently 2.9. So I always like to add a clamp node just to make sure that the alpha isn't going above one because it can cause some problems with defocusing and blurring the mat later. And there we go. This is the final output of the shot. The copycat node's done a really good job of getting the silhouette in just under 40 minutes. I've been really impressed with how well it performed, especially on some of the trickier shots with lots of complicated movement. Hopefully this video was a good example of how it gets used in real world situations. Thanks very much for watching.